Santa Maria First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Bob Issop. Happy Independence Day weekend to all of you, and we hope and pray that you are safe and healthy. Our newsletter went out this past week via email and a hard copy uh, to those who are not on the internet. Let us know if you haven't received it so we can update your contact information and get it to you. In way of other announcements, our Zoom devotional meetings will be as scheduled this week, Tuesday morning, 9 a.m., Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. Look for the email if you are in our all-church email list for the login info. If you would like to donate flowers for our altar table, let us know. Let us know in the middle of the week because sometimes we are here Fridays, sometimes we are here Saturdays. Any other concerns that I, your pastor, needs to know about or have any prayer requests that you want to submit, you can message me to my same contact information that is in the screen below. Our opening hymn is America in the hymnal number 697, verses 1 and 4.
This morning, Becky Wade will bless us with a children's moment. If you have children in your household, we invite their attention at this time. And of course, you adults too can listen in. Good morning, boys and girls. It's so wonderful to see everyone again in this in this format. I can't wait till we can all be together again. Um, I'm here to bring you the children's message this morning. And I want to start out by showing you a picture of my family. And I just want you to think if you see anything that, that stands out to you or jumps out to you or anything. But this is a picture of my family when I was a little girl. And that's me, obviously. I'm the only girl sitting on my dad's lap. Um, and then this is my, my brother Andy over here. And this is my brother Jeff. That's my mom. And my dad is over here. And then this is my brother Bruce. He still lives here in Santa Maria. And I don't know if you notice anything other than the fact that we all look kind of grumpy. We were not real big on taking pictures. But I don't know if you notice anything else. Some people noticed that my brothers and I didn't quite all look alike. Um, one of my brothers is Korean. That's Jeff over here. Whoops. Jeff over here. He's Korean. Andy's Native American. And Bruce and I are a hodgepodge of things. And I wanted to show you on a map, because we were born all over the world, actually. This is a world map. This is the United States. <laughs> Doing this backwards is funny. Um, this is the United States. States over here, and I was born in South Dakota. My brother Andy was born on an Indian reservation in Nebraska. My dad was born in Kentucky. And then if we come all the way across the sea over here, my brother Bruce was born on a military base in Japan. My brother Jeff was born in Korea, which is, I can't get my, there. And my mom was born in China. Her parents were missionaries, and she was living in China when she was born. So even though we were born all over the world, we came together to be a family. And that's sometimes what happens. Sometimes you get to, to meet people from all over the world, and you get to know people from all over the world. And, and the thing that's interesting about different parts of the world is that people, people look different. Sometimes they smell different, they cook different kinds of food, they have different customs, different ways that they pray, different ways they go to church, um, different ways that they dress, because the weather is different where they live. And <clears throat> that's what makes us all unique. God intended us to be that way. He didn't want us to be cookie cutter cutouts. He didn't want us all to look alike. And, and that's, that's one of the most beautiful things about being a human being is that even in our own families where, where we're related to each other, we don't look exactly like our brother and sisters. Um, we, don't, we may resemble or have some of the characteristics of our parents, but we, don't, we don't, aren't exactly the same. We aren't interested in the same things they are. We like to do things that are different. And, and that's okay. That's what, that's what makes us special and unique. And when we go out into the world, we don't need to be afraid of people who might look different than us or have a different colored skin than us or, or have different traditions than us or worship differently than us. It's okay to ask questions and it's okay to say, oh, I'd like to get to know you better. You, you're interesting to me. That's, how, that's what I always say. You're interesting. Can I ask you some questions? And, and I've gotten to know some really fascinating people from all over the world, even right here in Santa Maria. And so um, I just hope that you will keep your minds open. And I'm going to use something called, I'm going to use a big word here, an analogy. An analogy is an example of something. I'm going to give you an example of something using something that you can relate to a little bit better. And I'm going to use crayons because what do we have in this box of crayons? Do we have a whole bunch of different colors? Look at that. A whole bunch of different colors. They're all in there together. And they're getting along just fine. There's no problems in the crayon box. Nobody's fighting to get a better position. They're all in there, snuggled in there together. They get along just fine. But they all have their own purpose. They all have their own job to do. Um, some of them might be more popular than others. Some of them might be more loud and boisterous than others. Some of them might be uh, uh, 
more muted or shy. Some of them might only get used every now and then. They, they, just, they just aren't a color that works for the kind of drawings that, that people do, but they have a special place or they come in handy for just the right moment because their gift is just for that one thing. And that's how we are as people. Some of us, like, like I know some people who are, are really loud. Sometimes I can be really loud and I can be really boisterous and excited. I know people who are really popular. Blue seems to be a really popular color when my, my grandsons come over. They want, they want the blue crayon. It's a very popular crayon at my house. And, and so, you know, I had friends in school that were very popular. I wasn't quite as popular. I was kind of the weird kid. I kind of stood, you know, I, I was a little funky. And, you know, people might think fuchsia is a little funky color. You know, that was me. I was the kid that was off to the side. I had a, a lot of unique things going on. And I didn't care. You know, well, I might have cared. But <laughs> it, it's okay. We need to remind kids it's okay to be different. That's what God wants us to be. It. We have we have oranges and yellows and browns and blacks and tans and pinks and and all those colors just come together to make a beautiful picture. And I want to show you one last thing. I drew a picture. I don't know if you can see that very well, but I drew a picture with one crayon. What do you think of that picture? It's kind of boring. It's kind of hard to see the detail. It's kind of dull. It it doesn't make much sense because. God wants our world to be full of texture and color and depth and personality. And so when we mix the colors together and we all get together and we get along and we find our place in this world, we can put our colors together and we can make a great, big, beautiful picture and put our light out into the world. And that's just what I want you to remember. I want you to remember that it doesn't matter what you look like or what kinds of things you do. You are unique. You are special. You are made in God's image. And just shine your light, like I've told you before. You all have your own special, unique gifts. You all have your own special light to shine. And we, we want to see how you shine your light in this world. May God be with all of you this day. Amen. Our next hymn is America the Beautiful, number 696, verses 1 and 3. At this portion of our service, we lift up joys and concerns of our church family and the community. We are happy to report that the results of last Saturday's uh, recycling event uh, brought in $370. We are grateful for Dick Best, who brought the trailer, and for all the men who volunteered and helped, and for all of you who 
donated your recyclables. So you can start again and please save for us. Although we did mention it in our newsletter, we recognize um, our graduates and June seems to have flown by, but we would like to recognize Juliet Peck who graduated from med school, uh, Lester Valenzuela from uh, SLO, uh, or Cal Poly, and Julia Rodriguez from Hancock College. And so as they move on to their next steps in their career pursuits, O oh Lord, we ask for your guidance and your gift of discernment for each of them. We'd like to pray for Destiny, who's a daughter of April Iglesias. She broke her ankle uh, a couple weeks back, and uh, she fell off her bicycle. So, Lord, in your mercy, we lift her up for patience for her mom and daughter as Destiny heals and recovers in God's speed. We lift up Jun Yamamoto this week for comfort and strength and faith in her time of loss and grief. For the Yamamoto family, may they feast on the good memories and good times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Last week, we also lifted up our Country Oaks care facility and for many who are confined to a bed or a room or other care facilities around the area. We pray for the staff who have to manage their meds and clean and feed them. And we pray for protection from transmission and further infection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. On July 1st, Marilyn Heinard Park passed away in her sleep after suffering a stroke the past few days prior. We pray for her son Ricky and the family for comfort and faith. Help Ricky to know that he's not alone and that we are thinking about him and praying for him and his family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also receive word that Alwyn Brown, who is Marilyn's best friend, is at the Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara, and she has now been transferred to the ICU unit and is on a ventilator. So we ask for her recovery and return home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so I, I invite you to bow with me for the pastoral prayer. <clears throat> liberating God who frees us from the bondage of sin and death. We come to you on this holiday weekend. We are so grateful for all the liberties and luxuries that we enjoy by living in this country, in this land of plenty. We are blessed by the diversity of colors and cultures, of ages and races, of creativity, ingenuity, and all the progress that we seem to be making. Yet we confess that we often falter in our freedoms, the freedoms and rights that we claim for ourselves. We often deny others. Oh God, we confess that we are often blind to our biases and prejudices, in denial about our systems and structures that discriminate, or are held captive to the economic machine that pushes people into poverty. We pray for the disadvantaged and the disenfranchised and those who are displaced. As our country and world is being ravaged by disease, as we experience pervasive inequities, imbalances, and insensitivities, we confess also that we succumb to them. We struggle to accept the immigrant, the outsider, those who are of different orientations and sexual identities. We are swept up in disease and discord. We often forget that wars are continuing, that there is fighting going on, that there are people missing and being killed. There are those who are injured. We are thankful for all those who serve on the front lines to protect our freedoms, and that there are first responders and healthcare workers and doctors and researchers who are trying to find solutions and treatments for afflictions. We ask for increased wisdom and for resources to be acquired and applied. We lift up our leaders, O oh Lord, who are torn by political pressure, who have to decide for the greater good. Prick their conscience, convict their hearts, 
and give them courage to do the right things. Help us as well to get along, to work together, to be respectful, kind, and compassionate. Help us to put aside our temptations to be selfish, to be insisting that we are always right and that we always want our own way, and to resist the tendency to be cold and uncaring. Move within us this day to our better angels, that we may be peacemakers and healers and reconcilers and agents and instruments of love that we may live the life of repentance and always acknowledging and returning to you and your will for your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time in our service, we ask for your donations to support our ongoing ministry. Um, you may mail it to our address uh, listed below. And we still are working to have online giving options up and running pretty soon. We hope at the end of July, and we'll let you know more information. So in this uh, offering segment, we will have a video of a duet of Jed De La Pena and Noah Antonio, who played last September here in our sanctuary. It is entitled, This is My Father's World. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation where you know that no matter what you do, someone is going to tell you that it was wrong? In today's gospel reading, Jesus is facing that sort of a situation. The reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, 
verses 16 through 19 and 25 through 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, my God. 
Let us pause for prayer. God, make sense of this scripture to us. Uh, Help us to take it in, to digest it, so that we may apply it, so it may be helpful and useful for our week ahead in our walk with you. May all that we say and do be glorifying to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As most of you have been watching the news, this past week was rough with the spike in coronavirus cases and the number of hospitalizations. In spite of the worsening of our situation, we, though, are still hearing that people are still resisting using masks. While the president's medical staff team insists that people wear them, there are divisions and rebelliousness that seems to be getting stronger than ever. This past week, I read this newspaper article in the LA Times entitled, How a Rights Obsession is Killing Us. There are those who don't want to have their rights infringed upon or taken away. And then there are many who say, for safety's sake, you need to wear them. There are those who want to have total freedom and to be able to go out and about And then there are those who are advocating, we need to be back on lockdown. There are are those who want their businesses to stay open. There are those who don't. There are those who insist that their churches be open. And those who say we won't. On this July 4th weekend, we celebrate our country's independence. We celebrate our freedoms and we claim our rights, yet we find that our freedoms are being redefined and reshaped and recast. In the article, it does say that Americans speak a robust language of rights but lack the language of constraint and moderation. At the end, the writer, Green, says that we need to see each other as right-bearers, as equal citizens who disagree with one another but who must figure out a way to live together. In our scripture this morning from Matthew 11, it talks about divisions and rebelliousness. There in their community, there seems to be elements of opposite groupings and camps. And in the first section, it talks about the parable of children. It says, this generation is like children who cannot play together happily. In this one commentary that I was reading, it was saying that in the Near Eastern custom, there are groupings of people by gender. And so the references uh, relate to a wedding where there's usually a round dance and the flute players or the the flutes are played by men for the dance. And then, of course, the other reference refers to those who mourn, of course, in uh, direct uh, reference to funerals, where the weepers and the wailers, that job is usually assigned to women. 
So the flautists or the flute players are playing the music, but nobody's dancing. And the wailers are crying, but others aren't joining in. So among the music and merrymakers, there's no cooperation, no participation. And same goes for the mourners, and the wailers. So within the groups then, there is disagreement, there's division, and there is tension. I was reading another way to interpret it is that the girls are at odds with the boys for they are not willing to fulfill their responsibilities at the wedding. While si simultaneously, the boys are at odds with the girls for not doing what they're supposed to do at funerals. But it could be that many individuals within these groups are avoiding and clashing because of ego or maybe they're lazy or simply contrary-minded and unwilling to cooperate and conform. Individuals within these groups could be vying for control or power or position. And in any case, what exists are competing and opposing extremes. And there's no agreement. There's a lack of unity. And there's just overall discord. The next reference contrasts John the Baptist and the Son of Man. It says that John is neither eating or drinking, and so he is fasting and abstaining. John is not celebrating, but living a life of self-denial and strict discipline. On the other hand, the Son of Man is ca characterized and perceived as the opposite. The Son of Man is eating and drinking. He is celebrate, celebrating and indulging so much so that people are calling him a glutton and a drunkard. Furthermore, he is seen as a friend of tax collectors and sinners. <clears throat> so the situation may be that some are advocating and aligning themselves more with John's ascetic, pietistic, more austere lifestyle and spirituality, while others may be promoting celebrating, partying, carousing, saying that the Son of Man is the one setting the example. So what we see is friction between these extremes. People are being polarized. And there's confusion, there's contradiction. People are choosing sides over here, taking positions and stances over here, and both may be judging each other. John's message is more about punishment and judgment and grieving and mourning, whereas others are interpreting Jesus' gospel as receiving good news of joy and celebration and freedom. John is eating too little while Jesus is eating too much with the wrong kind of people. The third reference is later in verse 25. It says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. <clears throat> the opposite ends of this case are the wise and intelligent versus the infants. <clears throat> Jesus says that God chooses the infants. God chooses those who are childlike in their outlook to reveal the gospel. Whereas the wise and the intelligent may be so jaded that they meet Jesus' message with cynicism and skepticism and their disposi dispositions and interpretations, maybe through the lens of arrogance or ego or entitlement. <clears throat> Who are the wise and intelligent today? or those who claim to be enlightened. What seems to be embedded in the American attitude of today is, don't deny me my rights. Don't tell me I have to do something. Don't tell me that I can't go out of my house. Don't tell me that I have to wear a mask, that I have to close my business, that I cannot have a church service. Or maybe those are the people who are in denial that danger is not imminent, or simply not there at all. 
those who profess to be wise or intelligent could be neglecting facts, neglecting science, neglecting statistics that may prove that we're all at risk. Leaning on unbalanced opinions and unwillingness to accept or acknowledge or admit that one is mistaken or that one may have miscalculated or misread the signs and the trends and the evidence. That's why in verse 16, Jesus says, can, what can we compare this generation, this antagonistic attitude, this blind mindset, this insensitive, selfish, and stubborn rebellion? You may have noticed in our reading this morning that we skipped verses 20 to 24, which talks about three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. These cities were unrepentant, unwilling to budge from their dug-in positions and not even open to any discussion or discernment or instruction or common direction. They're like feral cats going their own way. So Jesus says, woe to you. You are bringing condemnation on yourselves, judgment upon your entire societies. So how do we get out of this conundrum, this seemingly doom and gloom? Where do we go from here and where can we find relief? Fortunately, the answer is in verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. That's the old King James Version. The key word to the entire verse is that Greek word, pantek, which means all. Wherever you find yourself in the spectrum of extremes, the point is that Jesus is saying all are weary, all are heavy laden. You are all burdened, no matter what side of the fence you may be on. Romans 323 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's our common humanity. That is that which we share is where we are all flawed. We are all burdened. We all are in sin. We are all broken. The word for weary kopayo means to be engaged in hard work implying difficulties and trouble. And I like, I prefer a word, the word exhausted. Emotionally and figuratively, it could mean that someone is emotionally fatigued and discouraged. The English word for burden is from the Greek root word fortos, which refers to a ship's cargo. So in other words, we're not just carrying something in our handbag or in our pockets or our backpack, but the description, the feeling, the tone is like that of a ship's cargo. We are carrying this great load, and we need a ship to carry all of that cargo, everything. For this context, though, the Pharisees have saddled the people with law. The burden of having to follow laws, which is cumbersome, which is a load of laws, a library of laws, of do's and don'ts, which is too much, which is overwhelming, and they're overrun with all these laws. What is the one step of the step one of the 12 step program? We admit that we are powerless whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever else, and that our lives have become unmanageable. In other words, we can't handle it. We can't handle all that life is throwing at us. We're being crushed under the weight of the ship's cargo. But the good news is that it's not just some of us, it's not just a few of us, but Jesus says all of you, 
Come to me, all of you, and I will give you rest. Rest. What, what is this rest that Jesus is talking about? What is the relief? Now, we know that God rested on the seventh day of creation. The implication being, after all these consecutive days of work and toil, after all the intensity and the battle, Jesus says, take a rest. I will give you rest. Jesus puts it this way, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. What is different and unique is that the rest that Jesus is talking about doesn't mean just doing nothing. But Jesus was talking about taking on his yoke, which is the yoke of wisdom. There's a book of writings from 200 years before Jesus called the Sirach. And in chapter 51, Jesus may have had this in his mind when he was saying what he was saying. And it reads like this. Draw to me, you who are uneducated, and lodge in the house of instruction. Why do you say you are lacking? Why do you endure such great thirst? I opened my mouth and I said, acquire wisdom for yourself without money. Put your neck under her yoke and let your souls receive instruction. See with your own eyes that I have labored but little and found for myself much serenity. And the gentleness and humility take on Jesus' wisdom, put on the yoke. Now, what is a yoke anyway? I mean, we don't relate to that in our culture these days. A yoke is, is a wooden instrument that pairs two oxen together into a team. So Jesus may be saying, become my yoke mate, my yoke partner, and learn how to pull the load with me and watch how I do it. And the heavy labor will seem lighter when you allow me to help you with it. Roger Feld points out that the 4th of July is our sacred, civil, holy day, holiday. In God we trust, one nation under God. But he was pointing out how ironic it is that in our patriotic hymns, none of them mention Jesus. They mention God, but not Jesus. That's why Jesus reminds us Jesus says, all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. I will give you rest and peace, and I will give you that grounding. How are we able to, in this generation, get along as children who can play together? Jesus says, come to me, remember me, and I will give you rest. And we should be able to work with each other. Come to me, join with my yoke, for my burden is easy and light. I offer you those thoughts this Independence Day weekend. Amen and amen. So our, for our closing song, uh, 437, this is my song, and we will just do one verse. <laughs>
before I pronounce a benediction, I, I would invite you to um, continue watching. Um, Carolyn Krantz and Juliet Peck will sing uh, in our postlude, and it will be the Star Spangled Banner uh, in, in honor of this great holiday and our country. And so I invite you to, to watch all the way through. Receive now the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early Stop.